I've been concerned last year as well, and even more so this year, that we were overdue for a recession, for a market collapse of some kind, a, a, a very significant correction, if not worse. And the question always in my mind is, which way, are we, where, where will be the safe haven? Where will money flow when everything comes out of the, uh, when, when, the, when the major markets start to have some major difficulty? And so the question is, do, they go, do people go to gold or do they go to treasuries? And uh, those are the risk off options, it seems. And um, so we'll take a look at how that's, uh, how that's going so far this year and, and draw some conclusions about what we might expect going forward into the future. The mainstream assumes, of course, that the, uh, the interest rates are going to continue to drop forever. And so it's a no-brainer just to buy treasuries when it's risk off. You just keep making money in treasuries, and there's a lot of good reasons to believe that. As the yields continue to go down, the treasuries continue to go up. It's been happening since 1980. So there's a pretty good reason. Your trend is your friend, so don't, don't, don't mess with that. You see here 10-year national uh, treasury rates of some of the major currencies, and this was updated as of Friday when the uh, U.S. 10-year dropped to 1.15%. Uh, the United Kingdom is in positive territory yet, up uh, about a half a percent, a little less. But then all the rest are negative. Japan, Switzerland down almost 1% negative. So Germany, France, they're all negative. This slide is uh, out of date a little bit. Um, August 15th, quite a bit actually. Uh, we see a U.S. 10-year 10, 10 uh, Treasury rate there at a 1.5, so 1.15 now. But the point of this slide is that all the pink countries there have negative rates essentially across, some of them are all the way through the 15-plus year uh, yield curve. So the world is awash in negative rates and money is flowing, pension fund managers, anybody who wants to get positive yields, and why wouldn't everybody want that? The money is flowing into the U.S. So it's not just what the Fed is doing, it's global flows of money that's coming to the United States to buy U.S. Treasuries and investment grade debt. And this slide uh, was uh, something like 95% uh, something like or, or a large percentage of the world's investment grade debt is in the United States, is, is denominated in U.S. dollars. So that's forcing rates down the, the entire world. This slide just shows the correlation between U.S rates and Japanese rates, the uh, close correlation. So we've had this constant decline in, uh, in yields. Uh, every market cycle has lower, lower highs and lower lows, uh, and now we're down to uh, zero in most of the world, and the United States threatening to go negative as well. Uh, it's a perversion of nature, I think. Negative yields make absolutely no sense. And I think uh, we don't have any idea of what the consequences are going to be of, of this. But there's no reason to worry. You know, the U.S. Uh, thought that after we did QE, we could, we could, uh, the Fed could normalize its balance sheet, and they tried. And I think Jay Powell was really very serious about normalizing the balance sheet, uh, and he tried. And then the market uh, at the end of 2018, start of 2019, started to started to plummet, and I think Jay Powell realized that if he didn't start pumping money into the system, he was going to be blamed for the next market crash or worse. And so don't worry. I mean, we'll just uh, always take care of us. There's nothing, nothing to worry about. Just keep buying stocks. As a matter of fact, one of the Federal Reserve, I think it was Janet Yellen or somebody high up in the Fed, uh, I think it was somebody last week, anyway, was proposing that we do what Switzerland has done, and that is that the Fed should start buying stocks when the equity market tanks. So we have a, a complete um, move away from free market capitalism towards, uh, I think, totalitarian government when that sort of thing starts to happen. But, you know, again, why would you worry? Helicopter Ben is here for our protection. He told us that we don't have to worry. We can always print more money. There's no, no problem with that. But if you take a look at history, longer term uh, picture of history as Machiavelli did, 
And he observed that, si that uh, societies go through these long trends. When they start out under difficult times, they, people become virtuous and they help each other out. Um, that gives birth to tranquility, tranquility to leisure, leisure to disorder, and disorder to ruin, and then the cycle goes over again. And I think you can, I mean, I've lived so long enough to have seen quite a bit of change, social changes in America from the time in the 50s when I was in school, grade school, until now. Uh, the attitude towards money, towards people, uh, has, uh, I think, not been positive, generally speaking. Now, I had a Dr. Peyton Yoder, not nearly as famous as Machiavelli, for sure, but in terms of my life, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for Dr. Peyton Yoder. As a, a college uh, kid, I went off in 1965, more interested in playing baseball and drinking beer and looking at the girls than I was uh, interested in scholarly work. But one thing that actually stuck out in my mind was Dr. Yoder's conviction as a historian that there was a correlation between the debasement of a currency uh, and the morality of a nation and also the work ethic of a nation. So if you start telling people they can have something for nothing, they'll generally take you up on it. But if everybody lives that way and nobody is producing anything, then where, where does that leave society? Certainly, I think towards the end of Machiavelli's uh, Machiavelli's uh, view of cycles of history. So this was really the reason I started paying attention to gold. 1965, the global uh, current, we still had a, a, a global gold standard um, at $35 an ounce. But Yoder was saying, and he was predicting, and he was looking at what was going on with socialism in Europe and suggesting that we are still stronger, but we, we are going to go in that direction most likely as well. Um, towards, uh, towards the easy way out, taking, taking the easy way out and, uh, and not being responsible, looking for other people, politicians to take care of us. And uh, I think that that little cartoon sort of tells the truth that I believe is really true. If we, nothing is free. If we look to government to take care of us, we're going to give up something in, in exchange for that. And certainly the central banks working closely with government are giving us money, pumping money in the system, but at what cost? And I think that's what we have to be aware of uh, from a personal point of view and an investment point of view we have to be thinking about. When I was um, a freshman in college, uh, our, the M2 money supply was $453 billion. It's now $15.4 trillion. That was uh, so when Dr. Yoder was warning us, and now we're seeing a 34-fold increase in the amount of money that uh, it measured by M2, one, one of the more uh, frequently used measurements of money. And we've gone up 22.5 um, times since Nixon took us off the gold standard. That really allowed the United States to expand its empire. To, I mean, the reason we went off of gold uh, was so that the U.S. could finance Vietnam and socialism which is exactly the kind of thing that Dr. Yoder was suggesting was heading our way. The American government wasn't going to tax people to pay for a war over the other side of the world, and it wasn't going to tax people to pay for socialism, so it just printed money. And de Gaulle said, we don't want any of your increasingly worthless money. We want the real thing. Give us gold. Gold left the U.S. Treasury, went to France and elsewhere, or wherever other countries uh, wanted the gold. They got it uh, under the Bretton Woods Agreement. <clears throat> but the United States realized that if it lost all its gold, it wasn't going to be in good standing uh, in, as a world power. So Nixon just slammed the gold window shut. Uh, and that allowed us to print money seemingly. Uh, that combined with a military that forced other countries to use the dollar. The petrodollar became the replacement for the gold dollar. The, so there was a deal with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia agreed if we protected their, uh, their regime, uh, to require oil be priced in U.S. dollars. So all the countries around the world that had to buy oil had to find dollars. So there was a tremendous demand, there has been a tremendous de demand for dollars because of the enforcement of the petrodollars by our military. And that was required so that they could finance the military, so the U.S. military could expand to virtually every country around the world, either clandestinely or with military uh, might. But this experiment hasn't worked very well. 
a couple of uh, a couple of metrics here make that point. It takes uh, six dollars and sixty three cents. The lower chart there, six dollars and sixty three cents to create one additional dollar of GDP. Now that six dollars and sixty three cents is created by debt. It's not like you dug gold out of, the, out of the mountain and you have an asset-based money. We have a liability-based money. So uh, in terms of generating full-time employment, well, $20.09 uh, to generate um, uh, one full-time employment uh, growth by $1. So 20 to 1, essentially. So this is what we're up. It's, it's, a, it's a failed system. It's a system of Keynesian economics. It's not based on real market. It's a defiance of the real free market. It's what, we're, what we've been living with in, with in the Western world increasingly, and especially since the U.S. went off the gold standard. So this is what's resulted from it. Um, credit market debt to GDP three and a half times. Uh, that's compared to 2.55 during the Second World War. It's just another chart that shows the, uh, the gravity of the situation, debt growing so, so dramatically, uh, and uh, with more than a $22 trillion debt right now, a one per, just a 1% increase in the rates, $220 billion of additional uh, red ink or financing that the U.S. has to come up with. So we look at the different presidents of the United States, and it really doesn't matter, Republican or Democrat. They're all in this game together, including Mr. Trump. Trump is, in fact, the Republicans used to be the party that was trying to be uh, fiscally responsible, but they realized that if they were not going to spend money like drunken sailors, that their uh, competitors in the Democratic side were going to beat them every time. So the Republicans gave up the idea of being fiscally responsible because they wanted to win, too. And so... Trump is actually trumping everybody the way it looks because uh, this chart assumes that Trump is reelected and we don't have any recession between now and the next five years. Well, I don't think that's a really very safe assumption given the fact that we've already had 10 years uh, or so of, of growth, tepid growth, but nonetheless growth. So if, you know, if we have an ex another recession, what's going to really happen? This was uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth, who I've had on my radio show, uh, previously worked for Richard Fisher in the Fed. Um, and she just said, uh, she tweeted this out, Lev Brodsky asks a salient question. If the deficit is out of control now, when the economy is still growing, what will happen uh, in the next recession? Again, going back to the previous slide, uh, you know, Mr. Trump, uh, without, I mean, Obama came into the White House with his horrendous 2008 problem. And so you could justify his deficit spending, from a Keynesian perspective at least, more than you can justify Trump's spending now when things are going relatively well. But he's trying to make sure that they continue to go well for his election, of course. This is the first time that the U.S. budget deficit has grown during a non-war, a non-recession uh, period of time. This is really, I think, very, very important to consider this. Now, what's been happening is um, the foreigners, and uh, we'll get to a slide in a minute that we'll, uh, the, we'll discuss it, but foreign money has not been, is not being recycled. Foreign export dollars that are earned uh, are not being recycled to buy treasuries at the moment. Now, this slide suggests that might have something to do with the value of the dollar. As the dollar goes up, Maybe people think it's too expensive and they're putting their money, foreign, foreigners are putting their wealth somewhere else. But the point is that this is a very significant issue in terms of liquidity in the United States. If foreigners aren't recycling, recycling dollars that they earn overseas to buy treasuries, then the treasury has more of a problem. So we've had this, this problem recently uh, with, the, um, uh, with the lack of liquidity and, and this has happened, uh, the U.S. Treasury has been buying, has been buying, the four major banks have really been buying most of the treasuries. And what they've been doing, their uh, hedge fund clients have been then buying those treasuries in what I would call, um, uh, well, it's an interest swap uh, uh, trade that is very massive. And what they've been doing then is uh, uh, the, 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 foreign, the uh, hedge fund guys will, buy, will borrow euros or yen and swap them for, uh, for dollar treasuries and make the spread because the U.S. has positive yield and the others have negative yield. So it's a trade that has been going on, but uh, 
at the point where this where the banks uh, f for regulatory reasons couldn't take on more treasuries or couldn't do more of this lending uh, then the swap market um, it uh, it it um, it really froze up so we had uh, you know we had this this issue uh, of the repo market uh, in September the repo uh, interest rates went up to 10 percent uh, and that was because the uh, that that was that was because the banks could no longer buy the treasuries, and so that's when the Federal Reserve stepped in to buy treasuries, and they called it not QE, but in a sense it was the same thing as quantitative easing uh, to take the pressure, and that has not gone away, from my understanding. It's been a continual problem. The Fed has had to continual continually put money in the system, recycle it, but they're putting money in and keeping an eye on. They have to do that to keep the rates down because if the rates start going up, as I showed you a minute ago. $22 trillion and a 1% increase in the rate, uh, it's devastating. Now, um, actually what I just talked to you about, uh, the repo market, I'm going to let Alistair McLeod uh, explain it to, him, to you. Uh, this is a clip that I t I'm uh, playing from my radio show last week. Well, you were talking about the speculators of the currency carry trade uh, folks and, uh, and how they were stripping the difference in rates thinking there was no risk there. But that plays in also to the repo markets, I believe, uh, the, the repo problems that we've had in the repo markets recently. Could you comment on that, perhaps? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, the repo problem has arisen because uh, the uh, uh, prime brokers have had to carry more uh, U.S. Uh, um, T-bills and uh, uh, bond coupon uh -huh. debt. And at the same time, uh, these uh, hedge funds have been uh, taking out their foreign exchange swap positions mm -hmm. in increasing quantities. And what you don't have is you don't have foreigners buying, you know, sort of recycling their dollar, you know, the dollars from their, uh, you know, their, their exports into America. They're not recycling that those anymore into the market. So into the money market. So what you have got is you've got a shortage uh, created by the absence of this recycling on the one hand mm -hmm. and on the other hand you have got the sort of if you like the increased domestic demand for dollars uh, in the market to finance these uh, uh, foreign exchange swap positions and also the uh, uh, larger and accumulating inventory of US Treasury debt being issued by the government um, uh, you know and the banks just can't take it anymore and that is why you have the spike in the repo rate back in September. And what that is telling us is that the right interest rate in US money markets is actually far higher than the current level. Mm -hmm. The Fed is having to intervene to keep it down. So we have got a liquidity crisis which is not happening courtesy of the Fed printing money. And this is a printing money. I mean, talking about printing money, that was before the coronavirus. I mean, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is going to lead to so much more printing money. And so you can see that there's a tsunami of money going to be printed, not mm -hmm. just by the Americans, but by the Europeans, by mm -hmm. the Japanese, by the Brits, by the Swiss, by anyone with a decent currency. They're going to be issuing it in enormous quantities at the same time. So we're going to have a tsunami of money printing. And that is why gold has taken off. All right. Um, so, oh, geez, I realize I only have a minute left. Um, okay, so uh, a lot of people rattled by the market on Friday, the volatility in the gold market. This chart uh, was just brought to my attention this morning, and I put it in the slide. Um, Dan Oliver has been on my show a number of times, and he does great work. He's a hedge fund guy, but he's... He talks, the, the red lines that you're seeing there, those are the monthly average, or the per percentage change monthly for gold during, uh, as the Weimar Republic, uh, or the Weimar uh, hyperinflation was about to take place. People got really scared. Obviously, people would go in and, and, and leverage up on, on gold, and then they would get triggered out and so forth. So uh, the point is, the black line is where gold actually went. So don't be unnerved, is the message of this slide, by this kind of volatility that we have in the markets. Uh, I just I keep track of the monthly average price of gold. Each of those data points there in the red line, the monthly average price of gold. I like to do this because it smooths out and takes away this daily volatility that can be very unnerving. 
it's very helpful, I think, to look over the longer term at what's taking place. So the whole idea of hyperinflation, and I don't want to, you know, don't want to be spectacular here, but I think the point is that you realize what's really going on. Alistair was suggesting that what he sees is a great deal in common with the way we're behaving now with John Law's Mississippi company bubble. And that we don't have time to talk about that now, but if you look it up and realize the idea that you can just print your way out of trouble, you can just create money to create wealth, uh, it's, it's preposterous. But everybody that has an Economics 101 course in the universities have been taught that it's true. And so that's the way we're living our lives. This is a slide just to show you that in case interest rates go up, many times gold goes up as well. And many times gold shares do very well. Of course, if the real rate of interest is negative, then, uh, th then that's, of course, very bullish for gold. So how, in terms of the uh, risk which performance and, and where are people putting their money? Well, as of Friday, it changed quite a bit. Uh, so far, I would say the U.S. Treasuries are winning. Um, so far this year, if I read my slide, they're up 10 point, a little over 10 percent, where gold is up 4.8 percent uh, from January or December 31st last year until Friday. Uh, that is as of the 20, uh, the 28th. I've mislabeled this. That that was I took it as of. Uh, the 28th, so there's a mistake in the slide. So that brings us to the people that uh, the real reason we're here is to try to figure out how we can survive the difficulties ahead or thrive and make money. And these are the companies that I've invited to the show. Novo Resources, unfortunately, Quentin Henning couldn't be with us, but he's going to provide a, uh, a video that he taped just uh, two days ago or yesterday, I think. And uh, that will be, he's actually going to be on my radio show on Tuesday. Some very, very interesting things taking place there for Novo in terms of mechanical sorting, which Quinton believes is going to have not only for, not, not only for Novo, but for the industry as a whole, some great breakthrough technologies there. Um, Hand and Metals, which is another company that Quinton is uh, involved with, uh, is really exploring developing uh, the San Martin project. Uh, a very, very interesting story, massive sedimentary uh, hosted uh, silver, uh, gold, and uh, I'm sorry, copper and, and silver. TriStar Gold, um, very robust economics uh, project in, in Brazil, uh, Paleo Placer uh, project, uh, Ariana Resources, that, uh, well, a very interesting story about the lost cities of uh, Ecuador. But uh, in search of the lost cities, but in the route to finding those route, lost cities, they're also finding some very interesting exploration targets that uh, we'll hear about in a minute. Uh, and then GFG Resources has two projects, both of which I think have a great deal of uh, potential. Uh, the Rattlesnake Project, the Alkaline Project that uh, Quentin Henning is also very much uh, interested in and knows about. Uh, so I'm sorry Quentin couldn't be here to talk about some of these things. Uh, Newcrest Mining there is spending a lot of money, uh, at least they have the option to spend a lot of money on what could be a very large system. So uh, I guess we'll go to uh, Quentin Henning now and he will